faith. Something to hold on to, something to uh, go to in times of doubt. Uh, faith to me is um, believing in something 100%. Something that you're passionate about, something that you you stick to. I believe in God and I, yeah, I believe if you pray that stuff happens, I do. If I live a good enough life that whatever God there is, he's going to understand that I was an alright bloke deep down. I have no faith now. My beliefs isn't really a belief. It does really matter if you believe in a set of values, for example. I think that that's yeah. great. Faith means believing in someone, I guess. I don't know what there is, but I think there's something. I, I do know a lot of people that uh, have a lot of faith. I like the idea of evolution. I think it's good to believe in something. I don't think it's something that people need necessarily, but each to their own. So I was born in Penang and I grew up in Penang. My family was not particularly religious and I considered myself a Buddhist as I was growing up. I didn't like Christians back then, didn't want to have anything to do with Christians. And later on, during my school days, I had a very abnormal school and college life. Because I didn't get money from home, I was always working. I was known as the girl with the most part-time jobs. I was very lucky because I got a scholarship to further my studies in London. And on my second day in London, I was already knocking on every restaurant kitchen's door, asking for work. Because life had never been easy for me, I became very self-reliant. I thought that everything that I achieved was achieved through my own merits. Later on, I got a job in Hong Kong. And it was during the time when I was working in Hong Kong that I got a call from my mom one day. She delivered this news to me saying that a cousin brother of mine whom I was very, very close to had passed away. Now, this news really shocked me. I was very close to him and he is one of the nicest people you'll know. He was only 23 years old, went to bed one night and he just never woke up. It was just sudden death. Now that news really shook me up and I was just flitting in and out of depression. It was during that time that a friend of mine invited me to church and surprisingly, this time I didn't resist. This time I said, okay. And so I found myself at this church in Hong Kong and it was at this church that I got to know about Alpha. So I attended Alpha. I still remember it was the first session for me. I was one of those guests who like to ask a lot of questions and I like to get answers to my questions. So one of the last questions that I asked before the end of the session was, how do you even know if the resurrection is real? And then at the end of the session, my leader came up to me and asked to pray for me. During the prayers, something unusual happened. I started tearing up. I was just crying. I don't know how to explain that feeling that I was feeling. I, I, just, I think I just felt this overwhelming sense of love and peace. And during the course of the prayer, my leader asked me, would you like to receive the love of Jesus? And so I took a step of faith. That was the night I gave my life to Christ. Now, at that moment, there were no fireworks or anything grand of that sort. But I found that each week, I continued to go back to Alpha. And at the end of the 10 weeks, I suddenly noticed this change in myself. It was almost like I was a completely new person. And for me, life was never the same since then. When someone becomes a Christian, it's a bit like that. It's almost like you become a new person. Now let's look at this verse from 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, which says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Now relationships are exciting, but the most exciting relationship of all is our relationship with God. In this session, we're going to be looking at what is faith in God. How do I know if I'm a Christian? And what makes someone a Christian? Now, some people may say, well, a Christian is just someone who is a nice person. Technically, that's not correct. Because you could be an atheist, 
and you could be a nice person too. But the atheist wouldn't necessarily want to be called a Christian because he's not. Or some people may say, well, my parents are Christians, so I guess I am too. Others may say, I believe in God, that's enough. But you know what? In the Bible, it says that even demons believe in God. Now, others may say, well, I go to church every Sunday, so that means I'm a Christian. Well, not quite. I go to Mengge Cha Siu for Cha Siu Fan on Sundays. Does that make me a piece of Cha Siu? No, right? <laughs> so, just because I go to church, it doesn't automatically make me a Christian. A Christian is a Christian, a follower of Christ Jesus, someone who has a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, how that relationship happens will vary enormously with different people. Some people know the exact date, like me. I can tell you that it happened on the 22nd of September, 2009. Well, for some others, they may say, well, you know what, I can't remember a time when I wasn't a Christian. Or some others may say, I remember a time when I wasn't a Christian, and I'm a Christian now, but I can't exactly tell you how it happened. Now, it was a bit of a process. It doesn't matter if you knew the exact date or not. That doesn't matter. What really matters is that you know that you are a Christian now. Now, C.S. Lewis said this. He used this analogy, and I'm going to read this to you. It's a bit like if you're on a train from Paris to Berlin. Some people will be awake at the moment the train crosses the border, and they'll know the exact moment it happened. Other people won't. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you know that you're in Berlin now. And what matters is that you know that you're a Christian now. And you can know that. And I stress the point that you can know that. St. John writes this in John chapter 1, verse 12. Yet to all who receive him, to those who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In other words, it's the closest possible relationship with God. A child of God. Imagine that. The point is this. If you're in a relationship, you know you're in a relationship. Now we ask this question in our Alpha questionnaire. Would you consider yourself a Christian before you came on to Alpha? And here were some of the answers to that. One person wrote, yes, but without any real experience of a relationship with God. Another wrote this, sort of, and another, in inverted commas, and another, not sure, and another, ish, and another, yes, though looking back, possibly no, well, now, if you're in a relationship, you know that you're in a relationship. Supposing if you were to ask me, Man, are you your father's daughter? And supposing I were to answer you, um, yes, but without any real experience of a relationship, or sort of, or in inverted commas, or not sure, or ish, or yes, though looking back, possibly no. I think that might cause a few raised eyebrows in the room. The thing is, God wants us to be sure. And St. John writes this in 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. How can we know that? How can we know that we're a Christian? How can we know that we have eternal life? Our confidence, our knowledge is based on, now let's use this analogy of a tripod, a three-legged tripod, this tripod that has three legs, and each leg is equally important, and each leg has a different representation. They represent the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at the first leg of the tripod, which is the Word of God. Our confidence is based on this book, the Bible, the promises contained within the Bible. And therefore, it's based on facts and not on feelings. If you were to ask me if I'm a Malaysian, 
I would point you to this document here. My passport. Maybe it will appear on screen. <laughs> yeah. So that is proof that I'm a Malaysian. And if you were to ask me if I'm a Christian, I would point you to this book, the Bible, the promises contained within the Bible. So what is faith? Let's take a look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And it says this. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, our feelings are changeable. It goes up and it goes down. If something good happens, we're happy. If something bad happens, we're unhappy. Now, if our faith would be dependent on our feelings, imagine that. We can never be sure if we're a Christian or not. Some days we would be, and some days we wouldn't be. But it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be that way. This faith that we have is dependent on the promises of God. Now, there was a very famous pre-Raphaelite painter called Holman Hunt, and he painted this famous painting called The Light of the World Painting. And it illustrates this verse in Revelation 3.20 really well. This first promise is um, from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. So this painting that Holman Hahn painted, the Light of the World painting, it is a perfect depiction of this verse. It shows Jesus standing at the door of a house and he's about to knock. And you can see that um, this particular person, he has never opened up his heart to Jesus, and it's represented by, you can see the weeds, the thistles, and the thorns growing around the door. And Jesus is saying, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, invites me in, I will come in and eat with them, and they with me. Now, eating together in the Middle Eastern culture is something very special. It is a sign of friendship. He's saying, in other words, I want to come in and have a friendship with you, to have a relationship with you. Well then, as Holman Hun was painting this painting, there was a man that came up to him and said, I think there's something wrong with your painting. So Holman Hun said, what's that? And this man said, there's no handle on the door. And Holman Hun said, it's not a mistake. There is a handle. It's just that the handle is on the inside. Now, Jesus, he is a perfect gentleman. He will never barge his way in. He will never push his way in. And this is what he said. He said, he stands at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens it, then I will come in. Notice that he didn't say, I might come in. He said, I will come in. And that it's a promise. Another promise that Jesus said in the Bible is that I will always be with you. Once he's come in, we can be assured that he will, he's always with us. It doesn't matter if we're always talking to him or not. It doesn't really matter. And we don't have to. It's almost like if you're working in an office with someone, it doesn't mean that you're constantly talking to that person. But you just know that their presence is in the room. Another one of um, Jesus' promise in the Bible is that I give them eternal life. We looked the first week at the evidence of the resurrection and the implications of the resurrection are staggering because Jesus rising from the dead assures us, first of all, about the past. Now that's the first leg of the tripod, which is the Word of God. The second leg of the tripod is the work of Jesus is based not what on what we do, but based on what Jesus has done on the cross. Again, if you ask me how I know I'm a Malaysian, first of all, I would point you to this document, which is my passport. But another thing that I can point you to is an event, which is 20th of April, many, many years ago, the day that I was born in Penang. 
And if you ask me how I know I'm a Christian, well, first of all, I'll point you to this book, The Promises Contained Within the Bible, but I could also point you to an event that happened, which is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how we know that Jesus loves us. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, St. Paul writes this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or, as some versions put it, the free gift of God. Well, I don't know about you, but when I hear free gift, I immediately get very suspicious. I'm cynical about free gifts. Well, let's not even talk about free gifts. Even if something is just abnormally cheaper than it should be, we would be a bit suspicious. I remember one time, I bought this gym membership that was ridiculously cheap from an online group buying website. So I was really happy, very pleased with myself. And I went along to this gym. It was a one-month unlimited pass to use the gym. And what I later soon found out was that after that one month was up, when I tried to quit the gym, I couldn't. They just wouldn't let me go. They tried to get a consultant to speak to me. They tried to get me to sign up for an annual membership with a personal trainer for thousands of dollars. So it appears that there is always a catch. But then again, the gift of this free gift, this love from Jesus, it is truly free. Even though it's free, it didn't come cheap. It costed Jesus everything. It costed him his life. So how then do we receive this gift that God offers? We receive it by repentance and by faith. Repentance is turning away from the bad stuff. Now, Jesus doesn't want us to give up things that are good for us, but what he wants us to do is to give up the bad stuff, Things that may, well, on the surface seem like it's good stuff, but deep down we know that it's bad for us. We, what we left behind is nothing compared to what we will be receiving. And what we are about to give up is nothing compared to what Jesus has done on the cross for us. But we do have to turn away from the bad stuff. Now that is repentance. So we receive by repentance and by faith. But what is faith? To find out, let's take a look at this short video, The Story of Blondin. Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Blondin, was a famous tightrope walker and acrobat. He's perhaps best known for his many crossings of a tightrope, 1,100 feet in length, suspended 160 feet above Niagara Falls in the USA. His act will be watched by large crowds and begin with a relatively simple crossing using a balancing pole. Then he would throw away the pole and amaze the onlookers. On one occasion, he crossed the tightrope on stilts. On another occasion, blindfolded. Another time, he stopped halfway to cook and eat an omelet. In 1860, a royal party from England came to watch Blondin perform. After his normal spectacular crossings, he then wheeled a wheelbarrow from one side to the other as the crowd cheered. Next, he put a sack of potatoes into the wheelbarrow and wheeled that across. The crowd cheered louder. Then he approached the royal party and asked the Duke of Newcastle, Do you believe that I could take a man across the tightrope in this wheelbarrow? Uh, yes, I do, said the Duke. Ah, hop in, replied Blondin. The crowd fell silent, but the Duke of Newcastle would not accept Blondin's challenge. Is there anyone else here who believes I could do it? Asked Blondin. No one was willing to volunteer. Eventually, an old woman stepped out of the crowd and climbed into the wheelbarrow. Blondin wheeled her all the way across and all the way back. The old woman was Blondin's mother, the only person willing to put her life in his hands. Did 
Did you enjoy that? Now, faith is trust. Everybody exercises faith. Do you know that this room is full of people with faith? All of you are people of faith because you're putting your faith and trust in that chair when you sit on it, trusting that the legs on that chair won't give way. In a deeper way, when two people get married, they exercise faith as well. When you say, I do, you're entrusting your life to another person, and that is faith. Now, that's the second leg of the tripod. So first, we have the Word of God, and then we have the work of Jesus. Now, the third leg of the tripod is the witness of the Holy Spirit. It's based on Him and not on us. If you ask me how I know that I'm a Malaysian, back to that example again, I can point you to, first of all, my passport. Secondly, I'll point you to an event that happened, which is the day I was born in Penang. But I can also point you to the experience, the experience of living and growing up in Malaysia. Well, I know the fact that I don't like durian is not a very good testimony of me being a Malaysian, but I do like spicy food. And the fact that I can totally speak with a Malaysian accent. Ah. So, and if you ask me how I know I'm a Christian, I can point you to this book, this book right here, which is The Promises of God. And I can point you to an event that took place, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus. But I can also point you to experience. Now, we looked at this verse from Revelation 3.20 that says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Actually, it's not Jesus that comes in. The one that truly comes in is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. Jesus can only be in one place at one, any one time. But the Spirit of God, well, He can be everywhere. Let's look at it this way. The Holy Spirit is like the wind. You can't see it, but you can certainly see its signs and its impact. It's the same with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus who comes to live within us. And when He comes to live within us, we begin to see changes in ourselves. And I know some people are very nervous when we talk about change. What will that mean for my life? What happens when He comes in? He begins to transform us. And some of these things you can see very objectively. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Paul writes this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The first change you'll notice is changes in your character. Sometimes people say, you know, I'm a bit worried what would happen if I become a Christian. They say, I don't want to change. And if I did change, how would I change? Here's the answer. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are characteristics that begin to develop in our lives. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a bit of a process. Being a Christian doesn't make you a better person than everyone else out there, but hopefully it will make you a better person compared to you yourself before. It changes how we relate to God. One of the things that I noticed after I became a Christian was that my attitude to God changed, or well, certainly my attitude to Jesus. Before I was a Christian, the word Jesus, well, it was more of a swear word to me. Or if I heard people talking about Jesus, I would automatically just tune off. But now that I'm a Christian, whenever I hear people talk about Jesus, I would suddenly be very interested and want to know more and hear more. It's because I am in a relationship with Him. I know Him, and therefore I am interested. Another thing is that my relationship with other Christians also changed. Before this, I used to think that all Christians were a bit weird and they're just sad people. Well, my Christian friends used to invite me to church camp and every time I would try to decline. But after I became a Christian, I actually went to a Christian camp and do you know what? I actually found that, hey, these Christians, they're actually pretty amazing people. 
Next, my attitude towards other people changed as well. And these can be strangers, people that I don't even know. So I was volunteering at this soup kitchen, and there were these homeless people that came up to me. I just can't explain it. I just felt this love for them, even though I completely don't know them, and, I have, and they have nothing to offer to me. But I felt this supernatural love for them. And it's a love that drives us to want to make a difference to this world. It's not a selfish kind of love to just oh, make myself feel better, but it's that we're given a desire and a passion to make a difference to our world. Now, this is not an easy thing, being a Christian. It can be hugely challenging, but it can also be hugely exciting. Apart from these objective changes, there's also the subjective experience. The Holy Spirit brings a deep personal conviction that we are children of God. Then Paul writes this in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, and he says this, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, what's the difference between faith and knowledge? Let me use this illustration. So there was this man who was prosecuted for stealing jewelry from a department store worth $10,000. And the only evidence against him are his fingerprints that they found on the counter. But this is a very, very bad man because he denied the charges when he was standing trial and he made up the story. He said, oh, I was in the store that day with my girlfriend. We wanted to buy some jewelry and that's why you, you found my prints on the counter. Well, the jury, they, it wasn't clear whether they were going to convict him or not. They listened to all the evidence and then they had to make a decision. And they had to make this decision based on faith. So at first, it wasn't clear whether they were going to take that step of faith or not. But then in the end, they did. And it was only after, it was only after that they had made that decision that a police officer came forward to testify. To what, and he said something that he wasn't allowed to share before that. And when he was in the witness box, he actually shared that this man that they had just convicted, he actually, his convictions ran to two and a half pages long. And what's even more was that he was awaiting trial for two other cases of stealing jewelry. When that was revealed, you could see just this sheer sense of relief in the faces of the, the jury. They had taken a step of faith, but then they knew. Inviting Jesus into our lives is a step of faith. When he comes, the Holy Spirit testifies. He testifies to our spirit that we are children of God and that we are loved by him. I'd like to share another story with you. I lived in Mozambique for a while, two years ago, and one Sunday, I was in a little church in a town called Pemba, and this little Mozambican child just came up to me, and he was only about four years old. He didn't say a word. He just stood right in front of me, just looked at me with wide eyes, and he just raised both arms at me, and at that moment, my heart just melted. So I picked him up, sat him on my lap, and I hugged him, I played with him. And very soon, he fell asleep on my chest. He was like a little koala bear sleeping on my chest. And he smelled of sourish, sun-dried sweat. And he was also drooling at that time, so there was like saliva stain all over my shirt. But you know what? At that moment, I just felt this overwhelming sense of love for this child that I'd never met before, that I barely knew. And then I had a revelation. This is what God's love for us looks like. We may not necessarily know what we're thinking, what to ask of Him, but all we need to do is just to go before Him, to stand before Him, raise both arms and say to Him, here I am. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes to begin a personal relationship with God, to connect with Him. And that's all it takes for Him to embrace us. And that's how we know that we're in a relationship with God. We know it because of the promises of God that He will come. And we know it because, the death, because of the death and 
of Jesus on the cross for us and what He did for us. And we know it because the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. For me, I took that step of faith five years ago. Now tonight, I want to give you a chance right now to take a step of faith if that's something that you're willing to do. Now one of the ways that we can do that is by praying. So I'm going to be praying a simple prayer, and if you feel led to do so, you can repeat this prayer quietly in your heart. So let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me so much. Thank you that you stand at the door of my life and you knock. And tonight, I want to invite you into my life. I'm sorry, Lord, for all the bad stuff in my life, all the things that I know are not right. I turn away from them. And Lord, I ask that you forgive me. Thank you that you died on the cross so that I can be totally forgiven. The slate can be completely wiped clean and I can make a new start. And tonight, I put my trust in you. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to lead the kind of life that is pleasing to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.